exciting event that we have put together for you. Uh, panel discussion. Okay, I'll get the routine, Nisa. Very good. There we go. Uh, our general motivation for uh, the program tonight really has its origins in what has become a, a very chronic problem, I think, in American politics and the media today and in the lack of civil discourse as it relates to this country's efforts to address ongoing public, pol public policy problems. The inability of Congress, uh, the inability of the executive branch to work with Congress in resolving the fundamental problems that confront the country today. That's an ongoing problem. It's not a new problem. Um, there was an era in America's history where we uh, have had a rather ugly political discourse. I am reading John Meacham's book, uh, American Lion, which is a book about Andrew Jackson. And those of the, you that know history uh, might know that the presidential election between John Quincy Adams and uh, Andrew Jackson was a very contentious election and there was a lot of mudslinging at the time uh, and in fact the attacks got to the point of attacking wives and mothers so uh, a true low in America's uh, a democracy and our efforts to engage in what should otherwise be civic discourse. Um, that's the general motivation, and that's something that the Baker Center is really all about. Our efforts here at the Baker Center to promote civil dialogue, civil discourse, our efforts here at the Baker Center to get, bring together uh, people from differing political views to come together to hopefully reach agreement and concurrence on how this country should move forward with its politics, with its social policies, its fiscal policies, and so on. Um, the other motivation for this is much more specific, and that is the book uh, that Ira Shapiro, Ira Shapiro has written, The Last Great Senate, um, a, wonderful, a wonderful book that we will have a, a book signing for after the, the event this evening. Um, I have taken the liberty of, of downloading from, like we all do, right? We get everything off the Internet these days. I'd just like to read a quote from a Washington Post book review. The book is a tour de force meditation on the kind of high-powered policymaking and intricate legislative needlepoint that once seemed to define the Senate's work. Um, it was really the, the publication of this book, a recent publication of the book, that prompted us to actually put together the program. Our initial conversations were about bringing Ira in. We've been joking this evening if we could trust Ira alone to be, uh, you know, up here the, on the on the platform, uh, but the reality is we wanted to broaden this discussion to include a variety of other perspectives, and that's why we've got together a team of people, the team that you're looking at here. And I'm not going to introduce those folks. That's the task of Tom Griscom. So the format of this evening's event is a panel discussion. It will be moderated and refereed by Tom Griscom, and you can learn a little bit about Tom there, or you can do what we all should do: go Google Tom and you can look at his Wikipedia entry. Tom is going to do his best to keep us on track. I think you're going to find this to be, <clears throat> excuse me, a very lively exchange, and I sincerely hope that you find the discussion uh, and perhaps a little bit of debate that is very much in the spirit of the Howard H. Baker Jr. Center for Public Policy and a tribute to Senator Baker himself, who we are very pleased to have with us this evening. So I will say no more. I'm going to turn the program over to Tom Griscom. Tom, Thank yours. you, Matt, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, as we go forward, yeah, at some point, maybe halfway through, we're going to sort of stop talking up here, and I'm going to reach out to you all, so just be thinking about uh, questions that you might have, and then we'll go back into the discussion. Uh, if you look at the... Uh, screen uh, that is to my, my left, your right. Uh, Ira Shapiro who's in the middle. You can read about Ira. Uh, Trey Grayson who is on my far left. Uh, and then Pat Butler. Uh, so that way you get a sense of who is on the panel, a little bit about their background. This is kind of interesting because uh, I had a chance to uh, uh, to get in and, and, and see some of the reviews and some of the writing that Ira has done on the last great Senate because it's a time that Pat and I were up in the United States Senate with Senator Baker. So uh, this could be kind of fun uh, as we talk about the, you know, the, the definition of the last great Senate. Uh, let me also recognize we have two United States Senators in the House tonight. We have Senator Baker and uh, Senator Nancy Kasbaum Baker. Welcome. We are glad that you all are here. <laughs>
And so to set the stage, let me tell you sort of how I got here. We had this discussion a little while ago about what would happen if I had never been in newspapers. I spent 20 years of my career in newspapers. And I said, well, I'm not sure Senator Baker would have ever met me because that's what I was doing. But I said, in reality, I'm here because Senator Baker hired me years ago for one reason and one reason only. And it wasn't because I could write and do things like this. It's because I was 5'6", and he was 5'6 and a half. <laughs> and he told me the day he hired me, he said, well, I can see eye to eye on the issues with you, Tom. He said, you cannot grow. So I called my wife. She said, uh, tell me why Senator Baker wanted to talk to you, why he wanted to hire you. And I said, because I'm 5'6". And I said, so whatever happens, I can never be any taller than that. So that's the reason I'm here, and that's the reason Senator Baker gave me the chance to work for him for a number of years. And, uh, and it really, and I say this for Pat because he had the same relationship, it has meant a lot to us, and it sort of helped shape our career. So, Senator, thank you very much. Uh, plus, I've got somebody here who knows if I make this up, he will get up and tell me. So, uh, uh, so we've got that as well. So as we start, uh, I want to sort of use some words from Senator Baker. Very often the course of my 18 years in the Senate, and especially in the last eight years as Republican leader and then majority leader, I found myself engaged in fire-breathing, passionate debate with my fellow senators over the great issues of the time, civil rights, Vietnam, environmental protection, Watergate, Panama Canal, tax cuts, defense spending, the Middle East, relations with the Soviet Union, and dozens more. But no sooner had the final word been spoken and the last vote taken than I would usually walk to the desk of my most recent antagonist, extend a hand of friendship, and solicit his or her support on the next issue of the following day. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Where we've been, maybe where we can go back to, but also a recognition that, that while messy, as things may be messy today, we've all lived through times where there were tough debates. Uh, but at the end, people could figure out how to put the, the issues that divide them aside and still be friends. So Ira, Calhoun didn't like Clay. He didn't share his politics. He didn't approve of his methods. But he loved Clay because Clay was like him, an accomplished politician, a man in the arena, a master of his trade, serving his convictions and his constituency just as Calhoun was doing. Calhoun and Clay worked together because they knew they had to. The business of their young nation was too important, and their roles in that business was too central to allow them the luxury of petulance. What happened? the mic. <laughs> um, I think that what I tried to do with the book was capture a time in not long ago when the Senate worked in the national interest to do the nation's business. And the sentiments that were conveyed by that quote terms of Clay and Calhoun, were very much the sentiments that Senator Baker, quote, reflected, that the way the Senate of the 1960s and 1970s particularly worked. That's the great Senate that I have written about. It's interesting, I told someone today that I found something that was in plain sight but hadn't been discovered. If you Google the term Great Senate, you will find nothing except my book. <laughs> well done. It is quite common now, the reviewers actually say, well, today's Senate is polarized and paralyzed and, not, and dysfunctional. But not long ago, we had a Great Senate. They didn't know it till I wrote the book. But the essence of the Senate and the reason I'm so happy to be here today, tonight, Senator Baker embodied, he's on the cover of the book for a reason, he embodied the courage, statesmanship, and bipartisanship, and focus on the national interest. That was what the Senate was about at that time. 
Senator Baker was an extraordinary leader, an extraordinarily respected senator, but he also had many colleagues who worked in very much the same spirit. And so it was the Senate of Hubert Humphrey and Ed Muskie, of Jacob Javits and Mike Mansfield, and many others, Bob Dole and Ted Kennedy. What they were about was sort of a laser-like focus on the national interest. And that made it possible for them to have these vigorous debates and yet reach principled compromise and still think well of each other despite their disparate views, because that's what they were about. And Henry Clay is remembered as the great compromiser. Senator Baker, in his time, was remembered as a great conciliator who managed to find common ground between people. But it wasn't just compromise. It was the fact that they worked on the national interest and they actually worked with presidents, whether they agreed with them or not. So, Trey, you've been a candidate for the United States Senate. So let's sort of build off of this. And I, I want to use uh, uh, a, a couple of, of, of lines I've got and sort of see if you can help us. Trey ran in the Republican primary in Kentucky against Rand Paul, just to give you a context for the race that he was recently in. Thanks for bringing that up. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will give you a chance. I know. To... I'm from Kentucky. I, just, I, know, I know where I am. <laughs> I even wore a blue tie to taunt you guys. So, you know. so let's jump into politics and campaigns since you've been there. You're the only one up here who's, who's actually been who's run for elected office. Oh, I'm sorry, that's sorry. right. You did run for Congress in New York. I'm sorry, Ira. Dear I Rudy, you brought it up for him, too. Thank you. <laughs> so let's look at things that are said. Uh, you have a member of Congress that interrupts the President of the United States uh, and says he lies for the House. Uh, you have people in this country that question uh, the birth certificate or the, or the birth of the President of the United States, whether he's an American or not. You have Democrats who say that Americans, that Republicans want Americans to die quickly. Uh, <clears throat> and then a Democratic Party official who puts out a fundraising letter that refers to Republican activists as fire-breathing Tea Party nut jobs. So you ran in the state. You ran against a Tea Party candidate. And so do you agree with Robert Bixby, who's director of the Concord Co Coalition, who said this? Compromise is in very short supply. It just doesn't exist. It's 24-7 campaign mode, and the point of campaigns is not to come together. It's to beat the other side. Is that what you saw when you ran in Kentucky? Um, I lost, so, yeah. No. <laughs> I, I, there's a lot of truth to that statement. Um, some of it is the time in which we live. We're in tough times. We've got tough decisions that we have to make. The parties are polarized as never before, uh, or at least in recent memory. And there's a lot of dispute on how to settle some of these issues because of that polarization. We've seen, um, you know, one of the things, I lost in a primary. And primaries are very different types of elections than, than general elections. And I think one race that's going on this year that maybe is kind of instructive about this is in Indiana, where a long time U.S. Senator uh, Dick Luger lost re-election to uh, a gentleman by the name of Murdoch. He was the state treasurer. And Murdoch, in the primary, ran you know, to the right and ran as the Tea Party candidate. I actually said at one point, I'm never going to compromise. Now he finds himself in a general election trying to appeal to swing voters. And even in a state like Indiana, which generally sends Republicans to Washington, uh, struggling to win a race because that positioning that helped him win the primary isn't such a good position to have in the fall. So uh, that's why I can't give a, like, a wholehearted endorsement of that statement, because I think if it were true like that, I don't know that you'd, have to see, you'd see Murdoch sort of tacking back to the middle. Um, and I think it's, to a certain extent, a good reminder of the power that voters ultimately have, especially in the general election, to discipline some of it. But in the primaries, it's what we were seeing is, is the United States Senate and the United States Congress, the parties are pulling further to the extremes. When I was, for about, I guess, six years, 
from 2000 or from 1998 to 2004, the part of Kentucky where I'm from, northern Kentucky, the part up by the Ohio River near Cincinnati, Ohio, we had a congressman who was a Democrat who was more conservative than some of the Republican members of the House. He was the most conservative Democrat, and there really actually was an overlap. Now you don't have that anymore. We've, if you National Journal, which is a pretty straight down the middle publication, rates how people vote, and there's a gap now between the most conservative Democrat and the most liberal Republican. And the same thing is, uh, I think, true in the Senate. So we're seeing this polarization. We're also seeing, as I think you alluded to in the question, the rise of the partisan media. And a lot of people know who Alan West on the right and Alan Grayson, who lost re-election uh, two years ago. But um, Anthony Weiner, before he was famous for taking pictures, was well known <laughs> for um, being loud from the left. And so there's, that's how you get a lot of um, publicity. That's how you get a lot of people following you. And so it's, the incentives aren't aligned real well. And it is hard. I remember in my primary, at one of my debates, Rand and I were talking about the, um, the budget and trying to reduce the budget deficit. Because we both agreed that getting that under control was the number one priority. And I said that uh, Rand had said he would never vote for a budget that wasn't in balance. So I said, what you're saying is you would never vote for, let's assume for a second there were a five-year plan to balance the budget. That would be hard to get a five, to do it in five years. But let's just assume, you know, we're, I'm assuming, so let's assume that we can do this. You wouldn't vote for that? Like, we need every vote we get because that's a hard vote. You would never vote for that. I said, no, I would never vote for that. And by the way, that sounds like a Soviet five-year plan. <laughs> and that got turned into an ad, which, you know, and I said, that's just not, you know, what did I say? I said something along the lines of, that's just not realistic, your approach. And that got turned into Trey Grayson believes balancing the budget isn't realistic. Um, and that's not why I lost, but I just think that's a good example of, I mean, even a reasonable, even something like that was, was not reasonable enough, and the voters of Kentucky sort of rejected that approach. The irony is Rand has a five-year plan to balance the budget. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I'm glad he saw the light. So let's pick up on what Trey was talking about, Pat, about the media. Right. And we were in Washington at a time where cell phones looked like the size of a brick, and they still had beepers. Right. And, and it's only hard to imagine what it's like today where you've got the 24-hour news cycle. But let me read you something that's attributed to Tom Daschle. Uh, he said that the level of incivility in politics may not be substantially worse today, noting a pre-Civil War U.S. Senate confrontation during which one senator beat the living daylights out of another one with a cane. The senator also attacked his opponents as animals. Uh, but then Senator Daschle says if CNN or Fox News had been around covering that, God only knows what would have happened. What do you think would have happened? And where are we now when you look out and you realize that what really makes the news is the negative side, yeah. not necessarily the positive side? Well, I think what would have happened, would it, uh, that would have, that in, in today's uh, environment and with today's technology, that caning in the, on the Senate floor would have just gone viral and would have gone all over the world in, in no time. And uh, I think the, uh, the uh, opprobrium of public opinion would have, been, would have been very much against the guy who was doing the caning. And so you can have some, some rough justice pretty quickly here in terms of a, uh, of, of, a, of a public outcry. We had the same kind of situation just in the last couple of weeks with, uh, with, uh, with, with public broadcasting where I'm now, I'm now affiliated. Uh, Governor Romney was saying that in, in one of the debates that he wanted to defund public broadcasting. And uh, thanks to social media, uh, millions of people, literally millions of people, came out of the woodwork and said, uh, well, not so fast there, Governor. We, we think that this is, uh, this is important. This is a good value. This is something that, uh, that America ought to be proud of and so forth. And so the power of social media uh, to affect uh, uh, political discourse uh, is, is really quite remarkable, and, and it is growing. What is also happening with social media these days is that uh, people who are politically attuned are finding that they have a, 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 a very effective way to get into the conversation now that they didn't have just a few years ago. It, it's not one way from the political class to, to everybody else. It's, it's, it's everybody talking uh, uh, for themselves and, and having, a, uh, and having a, an important or at least a, a significant uh, impact on the, on the political process. We're also finding that these people who are, who are mostly, who are the greatest devotees of social media are also the greatest consumers of journalism. And uh, 
uh, we're finding, for example, that of the uh, uh, of all the bloggers around the around the country and around the world, uh, they tend to cite traditional news media uh, in in their in their uh, in their in their blogs on one whatever topic, and 80 percent of those citations are from four media organizations, the BBC, CNN, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. And so people in, in my old business, I was at the Washington Post Company for 20 years, are beginning to see that we actually have a newfound uh, relevance and importance in the, in the political process, thanks to social media, uh, that we didn't have just a few years ago. And we're looking at a, a, a new lease on life uh, to uh, to be able to do the same kinds of, of good journalism that we've been doing for for over a century. The Washington WashingtonPost.com has 20 million readers around the nation and around the world. 20 million at, at our peak as a print product, we had uh, a little over 1 million Sunday circulation. So by orders of magnitude, uh, we are much. Uh, the Washington Post is is a much bigger uh, uh, enterprise than it was, and a much more important global enterprise than it was, thanks to media technology. And I think all of this is going to have some impact going forward on the on the political process, on the media business, and uh, and on and on people's ability to affect their own lives and their own political fortunes. Well, let's stay with this though, because one of the big, you know, rubbing points out there is the protections we have of freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Uh, where are those boundaries? Where do you see those boundaries? Because yeah. sometimes you can go out there and make outrageous statements, but it's protected speech. Right. Uh, but you sit there and say, how can they say that? What are they saying that? Because it's really doing more to tear <laughs> things down than to build things up. So where do we find that? How do we find that real balance in here to say yeah. uh, and separate out truth from right. fiction? Because I think that's... I mean. If you look at the debates and things we've just finished, uh, we got all these talking heads up there, many of them that we know, and you wonder, why are you such an expert to sit here and tell me what, right. what I just saw and how to interpret right. it? So where do we find that point? When, when, when Trey is running and somebody makes this accusation, it's a real difficult to say they can't say that. Mm -hmm. So where, what, what do we do? Well, th this was, this was the, 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 the subject of a lecture that I did at, at uh, Princeton University about seven years ago now uh, at the 75th anniversary of the Woodrow Wilson School for Public Affairs. Uh, and my topic was the First Amendment in the 21st century. And, and I was trying to address exactly the issue that you're raising here, uh, and, and, and particularly in a time when, when more and more people have <coughs> Have, have voices and have and have the technology to have their their points of view uh, heard uh, by by people around the country and around the world. Uh, and I, my hope then was that was that uh, media organizations like the Washington Post and and others that that I knew best uh, were going to be able to to get a, uh, a a new purchase on on public credibility and public value precisely because we go through an editing and vetting process on, on the facts that we publish in our newspaper and, and online. Uh, nobody else uh, except these traditional uh, media organizations uh, thinks that that's particularly important now. You can say anything you want to say, you can make up your own facts, and, uh, and, and, and it's, it, it's, a, it's a difficult dilemma to deal with here, but I, I, I'm hoping that the that the ultimate recourse is for people to uh, to invest some credibility in people who are at least trying to get the facts right who go through a vetting process who go through an editing process who require you know multiple sources on 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 important facts and so forth and that people uh, as, as practical and as shrewd and, 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 and natively wise as they are, can understand the difference between somebody just offering some, some sort of uh, cockamamie opinion on something and, and, and somebody who's actually trying to get the facts right and, and, and offer some, some uh, reasonable commentary on these issues. I mean, th this is, we, we are in flux here. The media business is just getting revolutionized uh, every day as, as we speak here, and, and there are no final answers to any of this yet may, and may never be. But I do think that, it's that, uh, th that the fact that people are coming back to traditional media like ours uh, in, in the way that I've described with these bloggers is, is a hopeful sign 
that that uh, while while the truth will never catch up fully with the uh, with sort of the casual allegation, uh, that uh, the truth ultimately will be will be uh, found out and will be treasured by the by the American people and people around the world. So, Ar, when you've got uh, what I'm going to call outside interest groups like Gro Grover Nordquist, let's use him, uh, who is uh, uh, out there, you know, claiming that any Republican that even mentions taxes, anything like that, you know, they basically are toast. They're done. So those become great people to cover. Donald Trump. Donald Trump, if you saw this, has said, I think it was yesterday, I've got the one thing I'm getting ready to announce that's going to turn this whole election around, and people want to cover him and listen to him. Uh, this goes a little bit because at what point, I mean, they've got a right to say it, but how do you help people sort through, you know, this, this kind of discussion, these kind of statements, and, and figure out, you know, how do you put them in a context? Can you do that? Well, I think to some extent, Donald Trump showed that he could discredit himself in the political <laughs> realm. Norquist is a little bit different. And I have to say my perspective on this goes back to the character of the people that are in Congress and particularly the Senate. Um, I, I'm thinking when I compare the old Senate that I wrote about with the Senate we have today, uh, the people in the Senate that we had in the days that I wrote about in the 60s, 70s, and then continuing in the 80s, they wouldn't have signed Norquist's tax pledge. They simply weren't that kind of people. You know, they basically would, would have said, this is ridiculous. We're United States senators, and we're not here to tie our hands at the request of some, you know, right-wing tax lobbyist. There's Howard Baker is a good example, but he's not the only example of people who would basically do what Mark Twain used to counsel, which is sort of just do the right thing. It will gratify some people and astonish the rest. <laughs> and what I saw, you know, repeatedly <clears throat> in the Senate was that kind of behavior. And we lost that over a period of time. And to some extent, I, Trey mentioned that these are hard times. And that's true. These are hard times. The problem I have with that is the Senate has been in decline roughly 20 years. The Senate started <laughs> declining, in my estimation, during an economically prosperous time. The Senate basically became, and the reason I focus on it is not just because of my book. It's because the Senate at its best is the world's greatest legislative body. But at its worst, it's our most vulnerable political institution. It's the bitterness of the House coupled with the paralyzing rules of the Senate. And we've seen the Senate at its worst for a long period of time. And what I think and the reason I focus on this is that it's very easy to say, and I always say this, it's harder to be a senator now than it used to be. The demands of fundraising are so much harder. The lobbying core is so much bigger. The 24-hour media is so much harder on people. All those things are true, and they don't spend enough time together so they don't have the social capital they should. All of that is true, but that makes it all the more important for them to rise above it. And what we see instead is the hyper-partisan Senate, a product of what I call the permanent campaign. And so that, if you wanted to look, not to use a simple indicator of the Senate's decline, you would contrast Republican leader Howard Baker with Republican leader Mitch McConnell. And Jimmy Carter, in his last year, when he wrote his notes about his White House diary, he said, Barack Obama's dealing with a lot of the same problems I had to face, but I had one advantage. I had a bipartisan Congress I could work with. And by that, he meant the Senate, because they both had Democratic houses that delivered majorities. But he got to work with Howard Baker and that Senate. 
whereas Barack Obama got Mitch McConnell. <clears throat> and I want to focus on this because I don't, I think we all need to keep our rhetoric careful because there's much too much shrill rhetoric. But if you go back to January of 2009, when Barack Obama comes into the presidency, we're in an absolute moment of national economic crisis, the worst in 80 years. We lost three quarters of a million jobs in one month. And people say, was Obama naive to think that he could transcend partisanship? I don't think so. I think he believed the national narrative that we come together in times of crisis. And the Senate and the Republicans simply didn't do that from day one. So there are a lot of things you can point to, but there's no substitute for character in politics and just doing the right thing. So uh, we're going to see how civil we want to be. Because, <laughs> uh, Trey, I'm going to now sort of pick up on Ira's point, particularly about Mitch McConnell, because I know your relationship, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and read something that was clearly that came out of your campaign. He says, well, so I'm about you. He does not defend dement and like-minded conservatives from the, quote, extremist, close quote, label. What he does do is go on about how Jim DeMint has been a harsh critic of Mitch McConnell for working with Democrats, <laughs> then praises McConnell for keeping Olympia Snow and DeMint together on a few issues. So do you have a different perspective of Mitch McConnell than maybe ours got? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, I think the... I think back to the, oh, the January 09 beginning of the Obama administration when he had a 68 percent approval rating, which is the highest approval rating any president had, I think, since Kennedy upon election. And I also, then I, and I look and see that, uh, well, I'm not going to defend some of the statements, some of the actions of, of, of Leader McConnell, but, you know, it takes two to tango, or two to not tango, I guess. And the president didn't do a lot of outreach. You know, I suspect, I don't know this, but I suspect President Carter reached out to Howard Baker quite a bit. And President Obama almost never reached out to McConnell and the Republicans. And I think, I'm not blaming Obama more than Ob McConnell, I'm just pointing out that this is a larger problem in Washington than just um, a particular person or a particular leader. Um, and so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a, again, a product of this larger, this larger media cycle and the way that everything else is working. Um, I will say one thing. I'm not, I don't want to defend Grover Norquist, but I've asked this question. I've never been gotten a good answer. Has Grover Norquist ever actually beaten somebody in, a, you know, in a, an election? Because I, I think Norquist has become a symbol in the way we have a lot of symbols in politics. He represents something that's clearly wrong with Washington. You know, the pledge system, this absolute um, mandate on this is the way you have to do it. And if you don't have 100 percent, if you don't follow me 100 percent, you're my enemy. So I think, I, so I don't... Uh, but I have yet to find out a candidate that violated the pledge that he actually was able to defeat. Because I think the Democrats like to be able to hold up Norquist. Republicans don't want to go against him. I can do it now because I'm not in office. Um, but I just ra raised that question that uh, sometimes these symbols in politics become very um, powerful. And uh, I'm just curious. I asked a reporter to look into it once because I just was curious uh, at the, at the, if any member of Congress had ever actually lost or violating that pledge. Part of it is no Republicans really vote to raise taxes, so maybe they've never been put to the yeah. test. Yeah, right. um, ever since, I guess, 91, 92, I don't think there have been any tax increases. Um, and we may have, uh, and over the last year, my understanding is a bunch of Republicans have repudiated the pledge, who've signed it. Uh, I did, some, from full disclosure, I signed the pledge when I ran. It's actually fairly narrow. It's only on regarding income taxes. Most everybody signs it, but I know in the last couple of years, um, some Republicans um, have repudiated it. Um, and, but they haven't actually raised the tax yet, so I guess the hammer hasn't fallen. Well, it's a great point because I, I see Pat will say well, something. I'm going to take your last thing and say, but there's a whole lot of these little constituent groups on both sides. On both sides, absolutely, yeah. Both sides that in the media in particular, yeah. they make them bigger than life. They want to hold them up, and you see who, people who I think are, are very smart politicians, very smart elected officials who will just cower. Uh, at the thought that there's somebody out there, and, and you have no idea. I, mean, I, I remember it being in Washington where people really ran out of their basement, uh, you know, fax machines with letterheads that looked impressive, and there was absolutely nobody uh, with this group that had a great sounding name, and it would get covered. So, Pat, uh, do you want to pick up on what Trey was talking about? Well, I want to talk, I want to say two things. One, with respect to uh, President Carter's uh, 
uh, outreach to Senator Baker and others, uh, to, to put it civilly, that that was not his strong suit. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's a real tribute to, to, to Senator Baker uh, and, and, and others who served with him uh, that notwithstanding uh, President Carter's uh, sort of arm's length uh, relationship with, with the Congress, uh, they were prepared to rise to the occasion time after time to do the right thing for their country. One of the things that I think bound them together that doesn't bind anybody together now was their common service in World War II. Uh, I think this is a generational uh, issue here almost as much as anything else. Uh, the senator served uh, in, in, the, in the last days of World War II. Senator Dole did, uh, President Carter did, and, and many others had that same sort of common experience where they were uh, defending their country in, in, in a desperate battle against the most powerful, the, what was then the most powerful country on earth. And, 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 and emerged victorious and, it, and emerged also with a common purpose that they wanted the United States to stand for something, to lead, uh, to make the world safer, to make the world more prosperous. And that was an organizing principle that, that, that bound people together on both sides of the political aisle for at least a generation. We don't have that anymore. And, uh, and more's the pity that we don't, because if, if we did, I think notwithstanding all the things we've been talking about here, I think things would be different, because people matter. And, uh, and I think these, these members of the greatest generation uh, have, have shown us uh, how, how hard, important things can be done if there is goodwill involved. To the issue of, of how the media have, have sort of uh, helped corrode this process, and, and have made the Grover Norquist of the world uh, into something more than maybe they should have done. Uh, we, we have a new phenomenon since Senator Baker and, and even since Senator Kassebaum left the Senate, which is these, th this proliferation of 24-hour, seven-day-a-week cable news networks. Uh, in, in, our, in our last days in the, in, in the Senate with Senator Baker, CNN was in its infancy. But there was no Fox News, there was no MSNBC, there was no echo chamber uh, in which all of these uh, issues and these personalities like Grover Norquist and Donald Trump and so forth could have their say because you know, the, the networks have it uh, have as, as their greatest priority to feed the beast, to keep this, keep this news going for 24 hours, seven days a week. And uh, while, while the cable news networks together uh, only attract an audience of about 3.3 million people a day combined, and that's out of a, a, an American population of 300 million, it creates an echo chamber that, that gives these people outsized influence because the political class watches MSNBC, watches Fox News, uh, watches CNN, uh, and, and confuses you know, those, uh, those programs with reality. Uh, and, and I think, I think that's part of our, I think that's part of our problem. Uh, now we have government by talking points now. We have, we have an endless array, an endless parade of people who are, who are categorized as strategists. I mean, look at this sometime. I mean, pay some careful attention. These people are Republican strategists. They're Democratic strategists. They've never run a campaign. They've never run a congressional office. They're just there. Uh, and, 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 they're, and they're invested with this authority and credibility that they have not earned. And so I think, I think that's a, a big part of our problem that polarizes our, our political system and, and cheapens and, 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 and coarsens our, our, our political debate. And uh, I'm not sure how to get that genie back in the bottle, but I think that's a big problem we need to, we need to think about. Can I chime in with just a quick sure. anecdote about that? When I was running in 2010, um, one of the things I found that I had to do was, um, this is the kind of the peak of the popularity of Glenn Beck when he was on Fox and had that afternoon show. I was busy then. I couldn't watch his show. And so, but I would get asked a lot of questions about things that he said. And so I decided to subscribe to his, he had a daily email. Maybe he still does. I unsubscribed after the primary. Um, <laughs> but he had a daily email where he talked about, you know, who was going to be on the radio show or what he talked about on the radio show or his TV show. And I found that that helped me 
understand some of the questions that I would get asked, like where they were coming from or what was the perspective that the questioner was coming from. So I thought that was kind of a, you know, a good example of this. And now that I'm in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I need something similar for MSNBC probably. Um, but it was true. I mean, I, the Glenn Beck email helped me to understand why, why am I getting asked? Oh, because Glenn Beck talked about it. It, 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 is an, it is a very, uh, the, um, you know, it's a committed core audience that watches a lot of these networks. You know, they leave it on all day or they come home and they have these routines. And it's, it definitely um, has an outsized impact because then, as, as Pat was talking about earlier about social media, then it amplifies. So you tweet about it, you Facebook status about it, um, you Google Plus about it, whatever it is, and, and it gets out there and your, your, your circles see it. And so they have a much more outsized um, influence than you'd expect given the relatively small audiences in a country of 300 million people. So, Ira, in your writing in the last great Senate, where does this issue fit in there? Does this have, has this really moved that ball? Has this moved to a point where sides are so polarized? I mean, we looked at a picture outside here, Pat and I did before we came in, and saw the group of senators that came to Washington with Senator Baker. And we realized who they were, but that, it's not the faces that are gone, it's what they represented that's gone. So has part of what we've just been talking about helped create this great divide that's there now? I think to some extent it has. Um, I also think, though, that if you look at it candidly, um, this, this is not a equal on both sides problem. I mean, I think it's a more significant Republican problem. There has been a significant change in the Republican Party over time, sort of a series of lurches to the right. And it's, you know, if one wanted to point to a moment when the Senate changed, it was actually right after Newt Gingrich became Speaker and Trent Lott became the Senate leader. Uh, Trent Lott was committed, and by the way, this is from his memoir. Trent Lott was committed to making the Senate work differently and work more like the House, and he succeeded. It became a harsher and more partisan place, and many of the leading moderates, including Senator Kassebaum, uh, left the Senate in 1996, so that was one of the junctures at which things sort of took a turn downward. Um, the last, I mean, I... I do, Trey and I, he's, he's much more statesmanlike than I am, but <laughs> the problem that Obama ran into when he became president and the opposition was somewhat reminiscent to the opposition that Bill Clinton ran into when he became president. Uh, in contrast, when George W. Bush became president under unusual circumstances, he got quite a bit of cooperation at that time. That's how he got the Bush tax cuts and No Child Left Behind. So the media is part of it, but the changing of the political alignment and the, particularly the Republican Party's change is a big part of it. But doesn't that get us into the topic of gerrymandering? Where you sit here and you can all of a sudden start making tweaks and changes and, and what you're doing is you're building in place re-election, which gets us to what we talked about earlier, you basically are saying you run the campaign all the time because that's what you've created, is a, is a very partisan sort of way to look at who's going to serve. Is that? Well, it creates partisanship. It creates a lot of safe districts where the Republicans are more to the right and the House Democrats are more to the left in that sense. And so I do think, I do think that that is part of the problem. Um, well, I'll stop at that. So, Trey, let me take that. So what did you see in Kentucky? I mean, let me just ask you, could Mitch McConnell win today? Oh, he's going to win in 2014. But <laughs> could he win today? Um, it depends on, it depends on the it's, – it's so hard to ask, answer that. I was talking at dinner about if I were running against Randy Smith as opposed to Rand Paul, I would have won the primary, even given what – how he can run the campaign and what he ran on and the, the movement the, – the Tea Party and everything else. It was – running against the son of Ron Paul, which meant he had a brand name, and he had the ability to marshal resources that, that uh, somebody who did, was not the son of a presidential candidate who, cap, who, who figured out how to raise money in small dollar amounts and, um, and was able to bring in a lot of new people to the system. When I, on election night, I lost, and I, you know, I was, a, I was a, I'm still a proud Republican, and I quickly endorsed him. I said I would, we each agreed to endorse the other, whoever lost would endorse the, 
the winner, and I didn't hesitate. And one of the things that I did admire was all the new people he brought into the system. But I, I think that uh, Sen Senator McConnell, when he when he first ran, was a was a successful local elected official who was very politically astute. And I think that that having a track record of success, which is something a lot of people don't have when they run, uh, combined with that political intelligence, yeah, I think a guy like him could win. But he, uh, but a lot of it just depends upon the environment and and, uh, and and how well you can predict it. You know, it's. Let me just mention. Yeah. <clears throat> I remember that I think Trey's point that was an important one, which he referred to the Murdoch race, mm -hmm. where Mr. Murdoch said he wasn't going to compromise. He thought there was too much compromising going on. Then he starts running in the general mm -hmm. election, and he has to think about it again. Right. One way that the system does correct itself is, as Trey said, somebody has to run in a general election, they start thinking a little more broadly. Some of the Tea Party candidates were defeated in 2010, mm -hmm. and so the, the, the party that nominates them reflects on that, and perhaps it's a correcting, a correcting thing. I happen to think that to some extent the Tea Party is ebbing, uh, it's not seemingly as powerful as it was in 2010. But, you know, there's, there's no substitute for getting candidates that have a, a broad appeal. And, you, you know, the, if you're out there appealing to one end of your party to get a nomination, you will have trouble yeah. sometimes getting back to the center. Yeah, and it was an odd year. I mean, the reason why a lot of... I mean, Senator McConnell never gets involved, never will get in another primary again. <laughs> I'll be, I joke, I'm, I'm his last primary endorsement. But Congressman Rogers, who represents the southeastern part of Kentucky the, that borders Tennessee, they both were back being the primary. And, and the main, I mean, they liked me and they thought I'd be a good senator. I appreciate all that. But I understand how this works. The main reason why they were for me is they really thought if the, the primary was it. If I won the primary, we'd win the general. If, if now Senator Paul won the primary, we'd lose the general. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, Senator Paul won by about 10 points, um, but uh, that that outlet, you know, that a lot of the, you know, a lot of folks do get involved in primaries for those reasons because there is some of that self policing. I mean, the, the gerrymandering here doesn't impact the Senate obviously because Senator statewide races. But I think what Ira said is you have he he talked about the impact that the Gingrich Revolution had on the Senate. The other way is is members of Congress in the House are used to this constant battle, and then they go to the Senate, and that's just the way they are. Um, and what's striking is if you go to Washington, I, I was always floored by this. I mean, as partisan as Frankfurt, Kentucky was, there is this sort of like us and them sentiment in Washington. Um, both sides have it, and it's very, um, it's very, it's very evident. And you, you, have, you have to pick a side. And we have um, a gentleman who's spending the semester with me at Harvard. He's a, a fellow. These are practitioners that spend a semester on campus with us. And he worked for the Catholic Bishops Association. Um, he was the uh, one of their lobbyists, and he talked about how you know Catholic bishops tend to be on social issues more. Re the Republicans like their positions, and on so the social welfare issues, the Democrats tend to like their positions. And he said near the end of his tenure that he struggled because they, each side wanted them to be with them on everything. And he said, "No, we're with God on everything. <laughs> and we're, we're not going to go back and forth." And then that's you get a lot of this in Washington is that groups have to pick a side in its totality not on an issue by issue basis and it's it's um, so it's cutting it's not just our political parties it's our it's our groups it's our trade associations it's our um, you know special interests in Washington if you will have, are having to are falling into this let's turn to the audience questions out here in the audience yes ma'am you're being recorded and they want to make sure they can hear you don't get nervous And may I ask you, would you, do you mind giving us your name? And are, and if, are you a student? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm a student sometimes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. And uh, my name is Julianne Tejada. Thanks for coming. Um, you mentioned, you know, this kind of change in character in the Senate as being the driving force for the polarization. And I don't know, I, you know, I hear it's... Um, lobbyists, special interests, um, senators having to, you know, cater to where the money comes from. Um, is, it, is it more that, really, than character? Because, yeah, I mean, I think that's what a lot of people want to know. <clears throat> well, I, I, look, I think it's a lot of factors. And I have to say, 
Pat's comment about the greatest generation, certainly I make that observation in my book. The people that came out of World War II were a unique group of people. And then they mentored, they mentored their staff, they mentored the younger senators, so there was a, a character kind of thing that was carried forward. I do think fundraising is a huge, huge problem. Uh, it's not a problem so much that any individual contribution corrupts, because frankly, there were, these guys, are va guys and women are vacuuming up so much money, they need to do it all the time. They're not corrupted by any particular contribution. But they're not spending time legislating. They're not spending time getting to know each other. The Senate that we, we grew up in was one where the senators spent a lot of time together. You know, they were over on the floor or hanging around eating lunch near the floor. They were in the cloakroom. There was a lot of social interaction that has been lost since then. I hesitate on the character issue because, very frankly, I have to tell you, the greatest generation isn't coming back. So we got to find a way to do it without them. And, you know, to some extent, we need people, and I actually wrote the book. I get audiences that are primarily my age, but I really wrote the book for my children because I wanted younger people to have a sense that the government used to work and to at least absorb some of the personal, get a sense of the kind of qualities that made Senator Baker actually work with President Carter on the Panama Canal treaties, even though it was disastrous for his own hopes for the presidency. You know, that's simply character. And the John McCain phrase, which I think is a very good phrase, country first, that's what, that's what senators were supposed to be about. That's what House members should be about, too. And to some extent, that's been lost. Well, if I can just add a couple of things to what to what Ira was saying, and I think your question, Julianne, is really quite a quite a good one here. Uh, I, I have lived long enough to, to, to this night here to actually hear quoted a speech that I helped Senator Baker write that he actually delivered. <laughs> I mean, this has taken me 43 years, folks, and uh, and I'm going to savor this moment. But but this speech that the senator gave uh, to his uh, to his former Republican colleagues in, in 1998 uh, as, as a leadership lecture uh, where he talks about herding cats being the uh, being the operative uh, uh, goal of a, of a Senate majority leader and one of the things that that the senator said in, in, in the course of that speech is that is that the founders created a, a system in which we don't actually need great men uh, you know, if great men come along, great men and women come along, and there's a great woman sitting there next to Senator Baker, Senator Kassebaum has, has a wonderful uh, dis distinguished record in the Senate herself, uh, but we, we, don't, we don't and we shouldn't have to have uh, surpassingly uh, brave or talented or wise people uh, serving in the Senate in order to get the nation's business done. I mean, this, this has been a, a, a peaks and valleys kind of uh, situation throughout most of our history, and uh, we, we may be in a bit of a valley right now, but, uh, but the peaks will, will come. I think uh, on, the, on the question of money, uh, the, the wisest man I know in politics who's sitting in the back row here uh, has always said that uh, he thinks political contributions ought to be restricted to the people for whom you can vote personally so that uh, you're not able to go into some other state or some other district and, and flood the zone with, 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 with money uh, just so that you can have some influence on who's going to control the House or who's going to control the Senate uh, and, have, and have no interest in what actually happens here in Tennessee and what your interests are. 
Uh, I, I think I think if we could get to Senator Baker, Baker's formulation on that, uh, that would uh, one uh, greatly reduce this this massive flow of of, of money that's uh, that's that's overwhelming the political system right now, but would also create a stronger sense of political community that we are missing right now. And this goes to the gerrymandering uh, issue. Uh, we, we've gotten uh, our, our legislators have gotten so adept. At, uh, at at carving out, you know, very abnormal shapes of, of, of congressional districts, to say no more. I'm trying to be civil here. Uh, <laughs> that we lose all sense of a political community, that you live in a town, you live in a city, you live in a congressional district, and the people in that area are trying to work these things out together, and somebody represents them. Uh, and, 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 and that is what we've lost in, in the state of California, uh, they have created a commission which is which is addressing exactly this issue. Uh, it's a nonpartisan commission, and it is having some significant success in redrawing these boundaries to restore the sense of political community. I think if we can do more of that in more states, uh, I think we, we begin to, to restore the political community. We, we begin to restore the civility that we need to, uh, to, to make the wheels uh, go in motion. Another question. Yes. Wait, I Okay, and then we'll come up here. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, my name is Loretta Harbour. I'm an attorney here in Knoxville. And um, certainly I don't think anybody in, our, in the room here would disagree with the need for um, public servants and politicians who have greater integrity and a sense of uh, patriotism and uh, civility working together. But the other half of the equation I think we're talking about is, is the media itself. When I was a little girl, um, I grew up watching uh, David Brinkley and Chet Huntley and Walter Cronkite. My father and mother held these people up as people of integrity and great intelligence and objectivity. Today, um, it doesn't seem like you can hardly find a, a news reporter on the major networks who, who do have objectivity. They're very partisan. One's labeled right, one's labeled left. My son doesn't even go to the, the four you mentioned, the New York Times, CNN, Fox. He comes to me and says, Mom, I want you to watch this episode of Jon Stewart or right. Stephen Colbert. Right. And, um, you know, he, he, he comes to it. Those are very interesting and they make good points. But now I feel like young people and even a lot of adults get their news from those sources. And there's, they, it breeds a sense of... Um, um, uh, cynicism and almost poking fun at the whole process. So w how do you see, what do you see as the future for journalism and journalism schools putting out people of integrity? Well, isn't it kind of interesting though that the President of the United States goes on those shows and, and does those kind of shows similar to what we would, have, I mean I, I saw the same people you were talking about but now our politicians go there for a very, I mean, John McCain went there as well. So it isn't just the Democrats that are going, it's on both sides. Pat, you want to? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm on the board of the Pew Research Center, which uh, for the people in the press, and, and, and the Pew Research Center started out in life as the Times Mirror Center for the people in the press, which I helped to found with Andy Kohut and with Don Kellerman, who also worked with Tommy and, and me on Senator Baker's staff uh, years ago. And, and we, started, we started measuring public opinion of, uh, of, of, of the media, the credibility of the media, the, the value of the media, the usages of the media, and so forth, back in 1985. And so we've got a very long uh, baseline. And unfortunately, and confirming your point of view here, the credibility of the media uh, have, has just gone uh, uh, south uh, virtually since we started taking these surveys in 1985. Uh, it has leveled out right now to, you know, let's say 60 percent of, uh, uh, of the American people pl place uh, you know, relatively uh, 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 high credibility in, in the traditional media that you're talking about, the NBC News, ABC News, and so forth. Uh, that, that figure used to be, back in the days of, uh, of Walter Cronkite and so forth, about 85 percent. So we, it's been a precipitous drop, and I don't think we're finished yet. And, and one of the reasons that we're, that we're facing this kind of, 
this kind of phenomenon is that uh, with all the proliferation of, uh, of media out there and, and all these sources of news, particularly uh, since the advent of the, of the Internet, uh, the, the traditional news organizations like the Washington Post and the New York Times and others have felt that if they're going to add value to the equation here, if, if we're going to if we're going to be of any additional value to you besides the the recitation of, uh, of facts and figures and who, what, where, when, and, and why, that we've got to provide some perspective on on these stories, on these events, and that inevitably invites uh, some 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 commentary. Some uh, I, I don't want to call it bias. It's not intended as bias, but it, it's not just a recitation of facts. And so that phenomenon in itself uh, has, has, has contributed to the, to the decline in credibility because we're not just dealing in facts anymore. Inevitably, there are some opinions and, and conclusions that, that come with, with this new kind of reporting. And, and, this, and they we're getting back to where we were before Adolf Ox of Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, and then uh, of Chattanooga, Tennessee, moved to New York and bought the New York Times in 1896. And his marketing strategy was to, was to tell the truth, uh, which was a radical notion for, for, the, for the journalism business in those days, because uh, until he came, it was all party newspapers and, and, and very uh, obvious and, and, and committed points of view, and you had to read a lot of newspapers and so forth to, to, to draw your own conclusions about what even the facts were. Mr. Ox said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put all the facts, all the news that's fit, that's fit to print in the New York Times every day and sell it for a penny. And he did, and he, and he was remarkably successful with that marketing strategy. And that became the standard for American journalism for the next century. Now, with the multiplicity of, of sources, people are, are sort of uh, saying, well, you, you, you can get the facts anywhere. What, what we want to give you is additional understanding. And the American people are, are a little bit wary about accepting somebody else's uh, point of view about what these facts may mean. Yes, sir. Uh, Dennis Tippo, I'm a university development officer. Uh, my question is if you gentlemen could uh, look into the immediate future. November 6, we uh, elect uh, a president, uh, Mr. Obama or Mr. Romney, congressman. What do you think the scenario will be? Uh, Obama administration, Romney administration, dealing with the uh, various really challenges that we have, uh, domestic and foreign affairs challenges that we have in this country. I'll answer because I haven't talked for a while. I'm not going to, you don't want me to, give, I'm not going to give a prediction because I don't think you asked that, which is good because I don't really want to. <laughs> I'm not really supposed to. Here's what I, here's my hope, and I don't think this is totally Pollyanna. I, the last few years in Washington, both sides have made a conscious decision except when they absolutely have to make a deal, like to raise the debt ceiling, that they're going to punt and try to go fight in this election and get in a better bargaining position after the election. Um, you know, even like they can't even pass a farm bill. <laughs> I mean, generally farm bills have been fairly bipartisan. My hope is that once we get past that election, the election, regardless of who the president is and regardless of who's in charge of the Congress, I mean, it looks like it'll be divided. I mean, I, the presidency flip a coin. Right now, the House looks like it's probably still going to be controlled by Republicans, and the Senate, I think, flipped the same coin. And, and we, but so we're going to have some level of division, and it's highly unlikely that the Republicans will sweep the presidency, get 61 seats, and control the House. So you're going to have divided government. My hope is that given some of the, you know, the, the tax cliff, the, the, the sequestration, and all the stuff that's, about, that's happening, the, the need to raise the debt ceiling again, the need to address some of these, that there is an opportunity for um, a big solution. My, my sense is the way this is going to ultimately shake out is that a grand bargain, which puts us onto a path of addressing entitlement reform, addressing revenue needs, and getting spending under control, is actually easier to accomplish than piecemeal reform. Because if you're going to ask a Republican to stand up to Grover Norquist, he better be able to say, or she better be able to say, look, I solved the problem for 20 years. And I'm willing to go to the voters with that. And if you're going to ask a Democrat to, to um, cut the funding to Medicare, to save and preserve Medicare for future generations, she or he's going to have to be able to say the same thing. 
Um, and we've seen some nibbling around the edges on this, the Gang of Six, the Gang of Eight, Simpson Bowles. Um, even in, if you read Bob Woodward's book on the, the, the economic negotiations in the Obama White House with Congress, you know, they really did try. And, and the, the leadership, some of the leaders anyway, the, the president, I think, um, Boehner, McConnell, Biden, really did try to do a grant. They couldn't do it. They couldn't deliver their caucuses. And, but I, but I, I do think that over the next couple of years there is this opportunity um, because we've, cause, cause the problems are really big and there, there's a situation that, that, that is going to have to be addressed. And, um, but we'll see. I mean, I, I think that the problem has been, well, we'll just, punt, we'll just keep fighting and raising money because it's good for business. And then we'll go to the election and, you know, we'll, we'll battle it out again. But um, I just think that there is this, I, I just, there seems to be something there with this Pope Graham bargain, bargain. So call me Pollyanna, if you will, but that's my hope. Well, I, I share some of that. I describe myself in Washington as a relative optimist. That's relative to Norm Ornstein and Tom Mann, <laughs> whose new book is, It's Worse Than You Think. Um, my, my limited optimism is based on a couple of things and touches on what, some of what Trey said about the size of the problem. It's also true that members of Congress and the Senate are aware that their futures aren't very bright serving in an institution that has 10 or 12 percent public approval. So they have some incentive to do better. But the other thing is, and I want to go to that speech that Pat wrote for Senator Baker. Oh, good. About whether you need <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that speech. <laughs> that it's great to have great men and women there, but actually the system should work without them. Well, we can certainly test that since we don't have a lot of them now. But when I, look at the, when I look at the people that are in the Senate now, I actually see quite a few competent legislators who are veterans, quite a few promising people who are younger. What they need to do is shake off the hyper-partisan model that's holding them back, basically. A lot of those people actually know what they're in Washington to do, but they get frustrated and they're as angry as the public is because they're asked to sort of line up with their party as opposed to solving problems. Tennessee has two of the most respected senators, a veteran, Lamar Alexander, and a younger senator, Bob Corker. Both of those senators, I think, have been working hard in sort of struggling toward bipartisanship and kind of battling with the prevailing climate. One reason people think I'm stuck on the Senate, well, one reason I'm stuck on the Senate is I could envision it changing a little more easily than I can envision changing the campaign finance system, the 24-hour media, etc. You don't need that many senators to change their attitude to make the place work better. Uh, I would start with new leaders, but that's just a personal observation. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Chris Hill. I'm a retired professor of public policy. Um, the panel has identified perhaps four categories of phenomena that drive the current lack of civility, the gridlock in Washington, and so on. Uh, lack of fit characters, the people serving. The... Um, uh, structural problems associated with things like gerrymandering, the contextual problems associated with the media, and the fact that we're living in a really tough time. Now, fit characters, as has been pointed out by at least two speakers, weren't part of what we were uh, basing our governance system on. In fact, the Federalist Papers is very clear about that, not required. Um, we can't do much about the media. They are there. They are powerful. There's no putting the genie back in the bottle. Uh, the tough problems are going to be with us for a while. That leaves structure. Is there anything we can do seriously structurally? Uh, is there a grand bargain on structure? Do we need to take a hard look at some of the uh, really found foundational aspects of the structure of our government uh, that would uh, lead us to a new way to, to get, as, as I think someone said on the panel, to get along without them uh, which is the greatest generation that we no longer have. Let me put a point as you all think this through. We talked about this earlier. How many of you remember the phrase, the nuclear option? Okay. 
uh, and I want to raise this because of your structure point. It was At that point, it was Senator Frist, who was the majority leader, and they could not get judicial appointments through the Senate, even though they had a majority. And what they wanted to do is create this nuclear option, which meant in that one category, they could bypass the filibuster or a supermajority to get approval and just take a simple majority to approve federal judges. And the question was asked then was appropriate. You're in power right now. Do you want the other party, when they come back into power, to have that same right? Sometimes, and I raise this for you all to think about, we think in such short bursts. As Americans, we think in short bursts. That, some, that we need to look a little bit larger and really think through what are the consequences by something that may fix a problem we have today, but down the road we may wish we hadn't done it. So with that, who wants to jump in? Well, I'll say, excuse me, I'll, I'll, I'll just say one thing here that, uh, that, that you might start with that, that doesn't require anything except, except a change in, in, in what are mostly informal rules. Uh, the Senate filibuster system that Tommy was talking about uh, has 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 devolved uh, from what it was intended to be, which was an occasional stand on principle against all odds, where where somebody would stand up. You, everybody knows the Jimmy Stewart movie, uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Somebody stands up and and, and turns the entire Senate in his direction uh, in, in a lonely stand. Uh, well, filibusters have been institutionalized in the Senate now uh, to the point that nobody even has to, to talk during a filibuster. And you can run simultaneous filibusters on lots of bills while pursuing other business on the Senate floor. One thing you might think about doing is saying, okay, if you want a filibuster, you actually have to do it. You have to stand up on the, on the Senate floor for hours and days on a time, uh, at a time and, uh, and explain your position or, or hold up the Senate uh, for, for whatever purpose you, you may want to and see how long that lasts. I mean, it's gotten to be so easy now to filibuster any piece of legislation so that a supermajority is required to, to do almost anything in the Senate. I think just calling their bluff on, on a filibuster, uh, which is an easy thing to do, it doesn't even require a change in rules. I mean, it, it, it's, it's an informal custom. Uh, would uh, would would go at least some way toward restoring the comity and and the and the efficiency of of the Senate. I mean, the, the Senate was never intended to be particularly efficient, and that's by design. Uh, but it also was never intended to be a paralytic force in our government. Let me add another point to what Pat just said, and my two senators in the back may disagree. But there's also this courtesy if you want to put a hold on on a nominee that you can do it. Don't have to tell anybody. I think that ought to change. I think you ought to be will you ought to have to stand up and say That's right. it's me, I did it, and then it, then face whatever comes from that. But the ability to do that and hold up a whole string of things and never have to acknowledge me, there's a sense of transparency that might help. I agree with both those comments and I beginning of this year I suggested that the rules should be looked at and changed this year because nobody knew who was going to be in the majority or the minority. So that was a good time to think about what would be fair to a majority, the minority, individual senators, and the president, whoever the president was. We have a system where the Senate can hold up the president's nominations and stop the president from putting an administration in power. That's not right. Whether it's President Obama or President Romney, they should be able to get their government in power. They should be guaranteed votes on these nominations. Trent Lott has made the point that, that, you, that uh, Tom made. When did these holds become indefinite holds for no reason or any reason or no reason at all, as opposed to just a courtesy? Used to be, if you were coming back from a state, you would tell the leader, I'm very interested in this bill. Do you think we can wait till tomorrow? And the leader would give you that courtesy. The Senate would give you that courtesy. Now it becomes an indefinite hold for no reason at all. I wouldn't just make them identified. I'd basically abolish them. You want a system that is fair to the minority party, but it shouldn't be a system that one senator or two senators can obstruct the business of the Senate. I write about, in 1979, watching Senators Byrd and Baker contemplate the last round of reform in this area. 
if they didn't feel that the rules worked very well then and they made some changes, I don't think I'm radical in suggesting that we should think about these rules seriously. We have the only institution that I know of in the world that works on unanimous consent, unlimited debate, and irrelevant amendments. <laughs> that, that's not a formula for success. <laughs> that's a formula for paralysis. Yes, sir. I only, only had a couple more, and okay. as well as for those who really are interested in this, I'll give you two sources of uh, potential reformers. You might not like them all. I don't necessarily like them all, but one, I can't remember the name of the book, but Mickey Edwards, who was a former congressman from Oklahoma, uh, wrote a book, um, and it just published in the last couple months, and he has a whole host of reforms that are, some of which we've already talked about. Um, also, there's a nonpartisan group called No Labels, which has promote, proposed a lot of structural reforms and is actually been soliciting members and candidates to sign the pledge to do a bunch of them. And some, they range from uh, the cute, cute, a cute one like no budget, no pay. If you don't pass a budget, you don't get paid, which meant nobody would have, which is great. We would have not had to pay any members for the last three years because they haven't passed any budgets, um, to um, some of the things that we've mentioned today. But, and I think a couple other ones, just some procedural ones. Like in the House, most bills now go to the floor with what are called closed amendments. So the minority, or even the majority for that matter, cannot amend the bill once it gets to the floor. So it's an up or down vote. Uh, and this is a trend that it, it started at the end of the Republican um, uh, leadership, um, accelerated under Pelosi. Boehner's tried to weaken it a little bit and, and offer more open amendments, but it hasn't. And what's happened is when you're in the minority, you hate life. You have no voice whatsoever. And so when you get back to the majority, you want to punish. So there's um, – and so, you, so things like that. Um, open. We haven't talked about primaries a little bit. I, think, I don't know how it all works in Tennessee, but in Kentucky we have very closed primaries. Republicans only, Democrats only, and you have to switch your party affiliation by the first of the year to be able to vote in a primary. Uh, and, and independents can't vote in a partisan primary. So whether it's just opening them up a little bit or doing something radical like California did, which just said we're going to have a free-for-all. Everybody who wants to run is on the ballot in the primary, and the top two vote-getters advance. And so, for example, we, the, you have in um, two weeks, you have two incumbent members of Congress because of their redistricting commission that are in the same district. Uh, Congressman Berman and Congressman Sherman. Yes, that really is their names that they happen to rhyme. Um, they're both incumbent members. They were the top two vote getters, and they're running against each other in the fall. They're both Democrats. Uh, and we're also, in, interestingly, there may be some shots for some Republicans to get through uh, because a, a decent Republican won in a district that a Republican shouldn't normally win, but the, maybe a very liberal Democrat emerged in, in the top two. Uh, so these are some reforms that are out there. But Nick, Mickey Edwards' book and No Labels, check those out for some structural solutions on some of these. So, Trey, let me ask you real quick to talk about the Gabby Pack. Sure. Because here's somebody who ran as a Republican in the primary, gets beat, but he, along with, with former Labor Secretary Robert Rice, uh, is out there supporting a, an effort by uh, Gabby Gifford, mm -hmm. uh, who said there's a few Democrats left, 10, I think, said, who are still winning in Republican districts, but what we need to do is find and support those who want to have bipartisanship. Can you talk, because you were touching on that, can you drop that in real quick? Yeah, if I can, I mean, I need to probably explain. Gabby and I did a Young Elected Officials Fellowship. Um, it was started about five years ago. Uh, and this is another issue we haven't talked too much about, but the members don't know one another. Outside of orientation at the very beginning, they, they don't live in D.C. anymore. If you're not from the same state or the same committee, you never see one another in town. Uh, but Gabby and I were part of this bipartisan group of about, um, in our class, there are about 12 of us. And they weren't, some were liberal, some were conservative, some were in the middle. And we became friends. We stayed in touch. Um, you know, she would um, help me out a little bit behind the scenes, and I would help her out a little bit behind the scenes. Um, <laughs> on her election in 2010, I texted her and said, hey, good luck tomorrow. And she wrote back, yeah, I'm, I've got a tough Tea Party candidate. Sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, she, after she left the Congress, she started the leadership pack to try to raise money to support people who were solution-oriented, like she tried to be, like I tried to be. And um, so I agreed to lend my name to it. And it, it was interesting. I had um, some people say how crazy I was, and others thought it was brilliant, um, and from all parts of the political spectrum. But it, it is an attempt. It, it was unusual, and it got a lot of publicity because I'm a Republican, pretty conservative. Um, she's a moderate Democrat. Reich is pretty liberal as a Democrat. And um, we came together on this, this cause. And so I, I actually, I'm an honor, we're honorary chairs. I actually don't know much about the PAC. I just thought it was a good idea. So I'm essentially endorsing it. I have no idea how much she's raised or what she's done with it. Um, it's her prerogative. Um, but when they asked me, like, you know, do you want to run again as a Republican? I said, yes. You know, I'm actually, 
it broke when I was at the Democratic Convention for my job. I'm bipartisan. I went to both conventions, and I was reminded at the Democratic Convention, I'm very happy as a Republican after hearing some of those speeches. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I said, you know, I'm a Republican. I'm proud. I've got my Romney sticker, my Brown sticker, you know, my car in Massachusetts. I'm, I'm happy to be a Republican. I said, but if I ever get to Washington, I know I'm going to need to work with some Democrats, and maybe some of the Democrats and others that we helped with this PAC will be there, and they'll be solution-oriented. And um, so that's why I lent my name. Yes, sir. My name is R.J. Duncan, and I'm a uh, management student here at the University of Tennessee. Um, I'm very considerate of um, all of you and very thankful that you've come um, to present to us today. I, um, I really have a heart for finances. That's one of the things that I'm really um, looking at and one of the reasons why I'm very interested in politics because uh, in some ways I feel like uh, Washington is not only spending my children's money but possibly my grandchildren's. And so um, looking at uh, the financial uh, part of the election campaigns, um, the introduction of super PACs and other things, um, I'm almost reminded of some of the Cold War history that I've been taught about before I know that I was uh, a child past the Cold War um, era. But a lot of the same like arms race kind of uh, mindset seems to um, ring true as a good way to – kind of explain that. Mm -hmm. And so um, my big question is, wouldn't it make more sense if maybe a lot of that money, rather than going to cut down other candidates or um, going on a national level, what if that was possibly used to um, affront the issues? And um, do you, any of you all see a way to perhaps reroute that funding rather than uh, as smear campaigns towards something yeah. more like um, covering uh, the huge shortfalls that we have in the economy. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll start if you don't mind, and uh, they'll have better answers than me. But this, this is one of the things we've been actually thinking about in, in public television for the last few months. The, the, the Ninth Circuit uh, uh, said that it may be permissible for public television stations to now accept uh, political advertising. Uh, not, not commercial advertising, but political advertising. And there's a, there's a controversy within my industry about whether we want to do this. One thing we know we don't want to do is to import all of the uh, uh, negative ads that, that are just bombarding the airwaves on the commercial side. But if we could, if we could establish a system in which we can control uh, the, 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 the communication of candidates and causes and so forth to our, to our public television viewers, uh, that it has to be substantive, it has to be positive, you know, it, we, we don't, we're not interested in your, in your negative ads, uh, and, and we can apply that uniformly across the system. Uh, and and it, this year we're going to spend, the, the country is going to spend $8 billion, $8 billion on, on, on political advertising and other activity. You know, if we had 1% of that, uh, to do the kind of advertising that I'm talking about that, that, that addresses the substance of issues and only that, that's $80 million that we could, that we could spend uh, that could educate the public on what's really at stake in the country. And uh, I think, and some of my member stations think, uh, that that might be a pretty good in investment. But while we're just talking about $8 billion in completely negative uh, advertising, you know, it won't do anything about, uh, you know, even $8 billion won't address a trillion dollar deficit, but, uh, but, but it, 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 it and, and, and there's no constitutional way, I don't think, for us to, uh, to, to, to siphon this money off into some other cause, but uh, I think if, if we could get just a toehold here somehow uh, that, that says somewhere in this, in this universe of, of media, uh, we're going we're gonna to stick to the facts and, and to the substance and let people make a really informed choice. Uh, that's a pretty good start. Uh, let, me, yep. let me pick up on one thing. You, you referenced the arms race, and I think that's actually a pretty good analogy. Because one of the things that happens in, in races is it's difficult, especially po polling is so hard now. I mean, that's become one of the stories of this election is it's given the number of cell phones and people hanging up on lines and things like that, it's very difficult to get accurate polling data. So it's very difficult to find out what the status of a race is, who's up, who's down, that sort of thing. And in this 24-7 cycle, we crave that, right? Money, though, is kind of an objective way to measure the, how the campaigns are going. Because to a certain <laughs> extent, it's like investing in a company. You said you were interested in finance from the business side as well as you're studying. 
you know, if you, you might invest in a company because you think it's going to do well in the future, i.e. give you dividends, capital gains, and so you put money in to make more money in the long run. Similarly, some people, since there are multiple races you could invest in, you want to invest in the candidates who are going to have a better shot at winning. So, you know, if you're, if you're somebody who's going to pick up, you know, because a lot of these donors are not just uh, from a particular state or only in that district. They're given to lots of Senate candidates or lots of, a lot of House candidates, or these are PACs doing the same thing. And so um, there is some true, so there is this sort of, I want to go with the winner. I, so I, I raise money to begat more money. Money begats more money. You know, it's like, it is kind of like an arms race. Well, I can't get behind the Soviet Union. I have to have missile parity, even though we can destroy each other 100 times over. So it's actually, it's, it, it, you feel that pressure. I mean, when I had to raise money for my race, like I knew I had a quarterly report card, just like in school. <laughs> and I was going to be judged, and people, because it was a Senate race all around the country, were going to look at my, um, my report and see how I did. And that would impact how well I would, you know, my class assignment the next semester, the next quarter, would be how well I did that particular quarter. And the other thing is that I knew I could spend it to get my message out. Um, you know, unfortunately, the voters didn't like my product. Um, and so it didn't matter that I had raised the $3 million. They just didn't like what I was selling. But, but it's, there's some validity to that, and it, and it feeds on itself. And that's why these members every night have multiple events. They carve out money. They carve out time to raise money. I mean, I will say the good thing is I never once felt that anybody who gave me money um, had a, a ironclad expectation, nor did I deliver an iron, you know, that I was going to do something for them. You know, the money came because they thought I would vote because I believed what they believed or thought that would go the right way. But it wasn't like, I'm giving you this because I expect you to vote for this bill when it comes forward or this topic. They kind of knew that it, based upon what I had articulated publicly, what my views were, and that's why they were, they were for me. But, um, but it's, it occupied as a candidate a lot. The number one activity was raising money as far as from a time commitment. And number two, I couldn't tell you, sleep maybe? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was like not even a close second place. So we've been at this for an hour and a half, and we're getting close to the end. So I want to, Pat, I want to give you one more chance to listen to your words that you wrote for Senator Baker. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, and it's about the I'm Baker. I'm coming back here more often. I like this. <laughs> well, I've tried this too, as you know, and, and had the same failure rate that you had. Uh, the Baker's dozen. Be civil and encourage others to do likewise. Many of you have heard me speak of the need for greater civility in our political discourse. My friends, I've been making that speech since late in the 1960s when America turned into an armed battleground over the issues of civil rights in Vietnam. Having seen political passion erupt into physical violence, I do not share the view of those who say that politics today are meaner or more debased than ever. But in this season of prosperity and peace, which is so rare in our national experience, it ill behooves America's leaders to invent disputes for the sake of political advantage or to inveigh carelessly against the motives and morals of one's political adversaries. America expects better of its leaders than this and deserves better. So with that, I've got one last That's pretty question. good, Senator. Well done. <laughs> I got one but, but that was a speech that was delivered better than it was written, right? <laughs> right. Oh, by all yeah. means. Okay. We know Just that. Just making part. sure. Yes. Uh, one last question. Let's say that we're going to ask Matt two years from now to reconvene either here or somehow. And we're going to answer with this. There's other groups tonight that are talking about what we're talking about. There will be plenty after the presidential election trying to talk about what went wrong and all the negative ads and how to be more civil and all this. So here's the challenge. Two things, two things that you, all of you all feel as individuals could be done that might begin the path down the topic we've discussed tonight. Trey, what are your two? Now, I thought, you've always been starting with Pat. I was going to go. <laughs> all right, let me give you two. I mean, we've, we've talked about some things that I would endorse, but let me try two things we haven't talked about. One is a, is a, is an individual solution, and it's, very, it's more of a short-term thing, and one is much longer. It will not get done in two years, but I think it's important. So the first one is, and I want to ask all of you to do this, when you're around somebody who is on your side, so this would be somebody who's a friend, a neighbor, but somebody who sort of agrees with you on politics, you know, you're on the same team, and, and if that person, if you're around somebody or you have a friend who is a, says something on Facebook or something like that that's just wrong, incivil, insensitive, racist, stupid, whatever, call them out, 
politely, civilly. But, but I'm a big believer in people of their own side self-policing. It's a lot more meaningful when a Republican says about another Republican, hey, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have said that when, than when it's uh, somebody on the other side saying it. Um, so I think self-policing is something we all can do a better job of it. It's sometimes hard, but you know, I, I, if you find that opportunity, self-police. And that way, when, if you ever do that, somebody will hopefully self-police you. So that's one. And I think we can make individually some difference on the margins. The second one, and this is a long-term investment. One of my real passions when I was the Secretary of State of Kentucky, and it continues in my current job, and I know it's actually a passion of the Baker Center, is to try to improve the civics education of our schools. Um, over the years, as we broadened the mission of our schools to do more with uh, um, trying to prepare school, uh, kids for, for the workforce, which are important, we've squeezed out lessons on democracy and leadership and history and constitutional history, all that. Um, we need to do a better job of that. I, I think we can integrate that into a lot of the different strands of teaching that we do in other different subject areas, but that's something we have got to do, and that's a 20-year project. Uh, to get that return, but I, but I think some of what we see today is um, a product of that decline in the amount of classroom time because it's not tested, um, because we're doing other things, because schools are scrapped for resources. But that to me, if I could, um, that's something that I would start now because we can't afford to wait any longer on it. And our, before you speak, remember what brought us all together tonight is the book that our wrote, The Last Great Senate, and he'll be outside the door when we finish. Our, what are your two? Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. <laughs> and I um, get no royalties for doing that. <laughs> well, actually, having focused on the Senate, I'll stay with the Senate, largely because I think it's the place where you could actually make a difference in the short term. You know, Senator Baker in 1989 suggested the Senate should be like a national, basically the board of directors for the country. Walter Mondale has called the Senate our national mediator, and those are good sort of thoughts. I would like to see two years from now the Senate having looked at and changed its rules. I'd like to measure and find a radically reduced number of filibusters and a radically reduced number of party line votes. I think those would be the kind of indicators that would suggest that we were on the right track. I would also like to see a Senate that was led by a different people, Democratic and Republican. Pat? I only have one. I'd like to see more people vote. Half the people in this country who are eligible to vote do not vote. You leave your fate, your fortunes, the, the future of your country to other people. I'm, not, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. I know all of you vote. But there are lots of people out here out in the rest of the country and the rest of the state uh, that don't exercise the most fundamental right of people in a democracy. If we all voted, I think the, I think the potential for the triumph of extremism, whether left or right or any other way, is much diminished. I think the prospects for people who are, who are trying to divide the country uh, for partisan uh, uh, gain are much diminished if all of us really get into this game and say we're not going to take this anymore. We're, 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 this is not the way we're going to run our country anymore. You know, the social media that we've developed here just in the last few years have given us real power. Now we can we can we can we can create our own opinions. We can publish our own our own opinions of things, and and people in their millions are doing exactly that. We have to translate that into the ultimate act of democracy, which is to vote. And, and if we do that, I think that could radically change the nature of our politics and, and, and the future of our country. Uh, Senator Baker has this wonderful f phrase that, that elected officials are not always great leaders, but they're almost always exquisite followers. And if they understand correctly the, the true popular will on, 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 on a range of issues and with the native shrewdness of the American people and, and the collective wisdom of the American people, uh, I think we're all better off. But that's the thing I'd like to see, Tom, in the next two years is for voter rates to go way up.
So, Senator, I hope we took your topic and handled it well. And join me in thanking the panelists tonight for a good discussion. I like it myself. <laughs> uh, for each of you, as I undo the ribbons here, a little bit of a, a token of our esteem from the Baker Center. Thank you. Thank I you. think you'll be able to use and showcase. So, Excellent. And once again, thank you and thank you everyone. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.